it's about understanding why you do or you don't do things. So if you are thinking of, you know, whatever, getting a new job, quitting a job, starting a business, do it, you know, going on a trip, whatever, whatever it is you're thinking about doing, actually think about why you want to do it and why you don't want to do it or you won't do it. What's stopping you from making the decision? The reality is when you truly think about these things, most of the time what's stopping you is the fear of not being able to solve the problem. And, and, and I just think most people will find an excuse immediately, and that's the reason they can't do stuff, um, without actually breaking it down um, to solve a lot of these problems. Share the vision and mission around you are only you do only actually have the one shot at life and uh why waste it for 40 years doing that train trip one hour in one hour hating what you do and you know my vision and mission is to inspire empower educate people to make that most of their one shot at life and i don't want people to get to their rocking chairs and say gee i wish i just traveled the world or gee i wish i was a better dad or gee i wish i was you know took a risk on that business. Okay, everybody, welcome to this week's episode of the One Shot Movement Podcast, where we dive deep into the stories of entrepreneurs, business people, anyone that's out there making it happen. We have a phenomenal guest with us today. His name is Fergus Watts, and I love his story because he's had a high-performing sports career and transitioned that into business and now empowering children with the reach foundation as well and that's really a a passionate topic that i'm all about as well so we're going to dive into leadership marketing all things success so welcome to the show fergus good to be here craig thanks no worries i always like to invite every single guest just to uh fill out um i guess my intro of a bit more context if you can just share to the audience a little bit about your background and where you are to get to to where you are today Sure. Yeah. Well, I um, my professional career started out as a uh, as a professional footballer. So I was drafted out of school to the Adelaide Crows in the AFL, and then also played for St Kilda. And uh, a pretty brutal combination of a heap of injuries and just not being good enough ended the end of my AFL career earlier than anticipated. And uh, and then so I was, I was spat out at twenty two trying to figure out what the hell I was going to do next with my life. I thought I was going to have a 15-year career and, uh, and then it all ended pretty quickly with a busted leg and, and other things. So, um, so that was it. I then went and started a marketing company sort of the next year, so at about 23. And that marketing company is called Bastion. Um, 15, 14, 15 years later, it's, uh, it's still here today. And we do a whole breadth of, of marketing services, advertising, PR, um, research, content, all that sort of stuff. And, and uh, yeah, as we sit today, we've got 350-odd staff across three countries around the world. And, and and a couple of years ago, I stepped out of being the CEO of that. I'm still the chairman uh, and started as the CEO of the REACH Foundation. So it's, uh, it's been a great journey. I've been involved in REACH for, for 20 odd years i started out as a 15 year old as a participant at reach and then i was a facilitator here um, and then obviously when i got drafted and went on and lived my professional life it sort of took me away from reach for a fair bit and uh, and yeah now it's great to be back mm. and well, i do want to dive into reach specifically deeper into the show but just uh, one thing that you brought up there being spat out at 22 years of age and and a lot of people become lost in I guess sport and where do I go? This is my future. And you see a lot of people that really struggle to find a purpose in life. So I'd like to actually pick up the the converse, conversation there, if you don't mind, about you know having a, a career which was promising. You're a top draft pick in that, and then the world sort of turns on you due to injuries and you know things that may not be in your control. Some may be, but then being at an age where you're like, wow, what do I do now? I, I, what what does that feel like? And do you see that as a really huge challenge for elite sports people that do find themselves in that situation? Yes, um, it's a short answer to the question. It, it's Elite sports is an interesting one because um, it's so intense and especially when you deal with injury. So I, I broke my leg pretty badly i had 
12 or 13 operations over 18 months. I had osteitis pubis. I broke my jaw. I had shoulders. I had all sorts of stuff. So you, you, you're living your life in a lot of pain is, is sort of one of the realities of it, right? So when it comes to the, when it came to the end of my career, I was sort of like, I am over this. Like I'm over being in pain. I'm over having surgeries. I'm over rehab. I'm, I'm really over the whole thing. Um, but what I realize now that I didn't realize at the time that I think, a, a lot of elite athletes go through when they finish their their athletic career, especially footballers and, and full time professional athletes, is that it is your identity. Like I wasn't Fergus Watts; I was Fergus Watts, the good footballer. You know, the first round draft pick, the All Australian, the you know the AFL player. Like that is how I was known in my social circles. Uh, that's how people knew me. You know, sort of in a more public setting, and. When that's your identity and you're then no longer the footballer and no one gives a shit about you anymore, what happens then, you know? And you've really got to be comfortable with just being you and, and building a life that is, that is just as you. Now, that is something I think that is a struggle for a lot of people. I think it is a struggle. I think, I mean, you know, it's a big part of the reach work, but we don't do enough work at school and through our educational years understanding ourselves we try and understand every book we can read we you know we academically try and improve ourselves but we really don't do a heap of work on our emotional intelligence on our understanding of who we are what drives us what's important to us what our values are and why i matter as an individual um, and that really is the crux to a long you know a, a content happy life is is that stuff and we just don't do much of it so for elite athletes that come out of that, if you, unless you have that understanding of yourself, it can be a very difficult thing because you do lose your identity when you lose your job. Mm. Yeah, and it doesn't really matter, I guess, you know, people like yourself that uh, your career was shortened and, um, you know, I've, I've had uh, Lance Piccioni on this show uh, um, and he's had, you know, he felt lost, completely lost and spiralled out of control, really, um, if you go back to that episode. And he had a, a, another, you know, a mid-career, a good 100-game career and and then a person you would have played with who's one of my best friends, Stephen Baker, actually fulfilled a really long career and his whole life was football and, you know, losing that become identity. So it doesn't really matter what stage you are. If you're in that high pressure environment, you know, you, you are that person and you can feel, I guess, is it, do you think in sporting clubs and in these high performance programs, they do need to invest more time into life after the sport or, or are they doing uh, that? They're definitely not doing that. They say they do that, but it's rubbish. They don't. Um, but I'm also not convinced that you can truly prepare someone for life after, you know, life after sport. Like, Bakes had a hell of a career, you know. He was a great player, played for a long time. But I actually think it's harder for Bakes than it is for me because I was a kid. He finished at 30 or whatever age he was. I finished at 22. So at 22, I've still got my whole life ahead of me. I, I always say that whenever I talk to young footballers now that are um, and, you know, they're on the fringe or they're arming and arming about whether they get the next contract or, or whatever. I always say don't end up being a 27-year-old, 28-year-old, you know, with a house and a wife and then try and restart your career. If you're going to go and have a 10, 12, 14-year career as an open football, it'd be a superstar, earn good money, then terrific. If you're not, if you're going to earn mediocre money and not build any – uh, other skills apart from elite athlete skills at 28 29 it's a really hard transition you know to start your life again go from earning two three four hundred grand a year to earning 60 grand a year like you really got to change your, your whole output um so it is something that's hard could afl clubs do more could could elite sports do more in preparing um people for for life of sport yes they could is it on them i don't think it is you know, really when it comes down to it, because the diversity of people that you have within these environments, you have, you know, private school educated sort of young people, you have people from country towns of 10 people and, you, and everyone in between. And trying to have one sort of program that um, that really sort of caters for everyone will just be an impossibility. So, you know, I, I, I honestly believe that if we prepare school kids better, 
um, then they'll be they'll be better on where they go. Like I, I was having a conversation with a you know with a fifty year old man the other day who can't get back into the workforce. You know, and he's going through all the same stuff. Now he's built his identity on his profession for thirty years. You know, very successful guy. But when you get at that level, there's only so many jobs left. So, you know, you've got to wait for the next one. He's struggling to get back into the workforce. The longer he stays out, the more pressure he has, all those sorts of things. It's the same issue, just dealing with it at a different level. So, uh, you know, I, I think individuals got to take responsibility for themselves. And I do think that the schooling system needs to pr- prepare every young person that comes out of their system for life not just for exams. Mm, yeah, well said. Looking forward to having that conversation a little bit deeper into the show. But you moved into a, a business or a startup, maybe you'd call it, uh, the Bastion Group that's now 15 years old. You're chairman, you were CEO, you were a young CEO. You built a business that's international, 300, I think you said 300 plus employees. How did that start and what? why did it take off? Well, reach for the very first client, strangely enough. <laughs> um, I, it started because I got a job at an advertising agency when I finished footy. I worked there for about six months and then I just, I just thought, I, I'm not, I can't work for anyone else. It's sort of, it's not, it's not really working for me, this thing. Um, and I was, I found myself much more interested in the business side of the work than the work itself. So the, uh, this company had just gone through an acquisition and gone through a merger. It was, uh, you know, owned by a public listed company, all this sort of stuff. I was much more interested in all the machinations of that, the culture, the evolution of that business, all that sort of stuff. Um, and as a 23-year-old, I didn't know anything about anything. Like I didn't have a clue what I was doing. So I quit my job and I just sort of was arrogant enough to think that I could, you know, go and start a business really. Um, and the whole premise was I'll go and find people who know what they're talking about. I'll go find advertising experts or PR experts or research experts or whatever. And then I can just do all the bits around, around the outside. I can do the talking. I can do the selling. I can do the account management, but I need people who actually know what they're doing to go and do the work. And that, that's the premise of how it started. So ironically reach with a, which were the very first client. Uh, then I picked up a couple of other clients and then, you know, Basically, the whole premise of of how how we inevitably grew the business was that I'd go sit with a with a client or a potential client, and I'd say, you know, what are you, what are your business issues? A lot of the skills I learned as a facilitator at Reach, I'd ask them questions, and and I would use the active listening techniques that we we teach our facilitators here, and I could get really get to the core business problem, and that, as it turns out, is my inevitable skill with business is understanding a business problem really quickly and being able to come up with 70% of the, the required solution faster than most, right? And so I'd sit there, I'd ask all these questions, I'd, I'd sort of get to this core issue and I'd say, well, if we can help you with that problem, you know, would that be of value to you? And they would say, yes. I'd go back to the guys who actually knew how to do stuff and I'd say, how do we solve this problem for them? And then we'd come up with a solution to solve the problem. And th- that's how Bastion evolved. And over time, it became obvious that the skills we needed to solve the business problems of our clients, we didn't have. So I then had to go and find others that had those skills. And we would bring them in either through a startup, you know, new entity with a, a new service, or we'd go and make an acquisition of a company that's got those skill sets and we'd bring them in and, 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 that's inevitably how how the business has grown over time. Mm, so really, you nearly acted as a conductor in an orchestra, um, pulling people together and just you know telling them how to you know help out each individual, and it just organically grew. You were like nearly the people's person, the glue as a leader, the problem solver, the person that could build the relationship. And is that what you saw yourself as in a role? And do you think that's yeah. important for a CEO? Uh, I think it's very important for a CEO. I think I, I think the requirements of a CEO differ from business to business, depending on uh, the type of impact, uh, the type of services that a business offers, the type of size of each client, all those sort of things. Um, but inevitably, I think a good CEO leads growth and creates new opportunities. 
an operational team, a COO, uh, client management teams, operational teams run the day-to-day is my view generally on, on the way this stuff works. So a good CEO should be able to lead, culturally lead a team that has an operational team that can execute the day-to-day, execute the annualised budget. And a CEO should then go and find the new opportunities beyond that that can then grow. In our case in Bastion, it, those opportunities were about uh, bigger, more integrated clients, so clients that needed us to do more stuff for them, right? So ultimately, every client just wants to sell more of their own product. That's the, it's the only reason really our clients hire us is to market their services or their products so they can inevitably sell more stuff to their clients. Um, and bigger clients require multiple different ways of being able to market their services. Smaller clients generally are restricted to one or two ways. So our growth was in uh, finding bigger clients with bigger requirements and also ensuring that we could fulfil those requirements, not just by saying we can do it and half asking it, but by going and finding best of breed experts that we can bring into the tent and we can provide an integrated solution for that client. That was, you know, that was that, that was uh, that was how we grew, um, you know, and that was what I led. Like I'm, I'm to this day not a marketing expert or uh, run and own uh, a decent sized marketing company. Yeah, my expertise is in growing business. It just so happens I was growing a marketing company. Mm. And just my last question, I want to just go back to the sport, the high performance, the work ethic of an athlete. You see a lot of people um, that do high-level success transitioning into business. Do you think the drive and the, I guess, the work ethic and the focus is something that can that is why you see so many high-performing athletes transition into business and have a lot of success as well? Uh, I, I think uh, the answer is yes, but I don't think the elite sport environment creates that for people. I think people enter the elite sport environment because they already have it. Yeah, they already have the you know the obsession to be good. They already have the the the, the hyper focus on something that they already have those those personality traits that in social world are a bit off the off the scale because you know they. they they had those things through through their schooling years. They then enter the elite athlete environment. They fit beautifully within that environment because most have those, you know, that hyper focus. And then when they come out of the elite environment, one, one of the things I really struggled with, and a lot of elite athletes that I've spoken to struggle with, is that the the general world is is not an elite environment. You know, like I remember one organisation I, I was sitting and talking about. Yeah, you know, they want to create a high performance culture. I said, yeah, you're kidding yourselves. Like you're so far away from what a high performance culture actually is. And the reality of, you know, 15 people going out and having a smoke break every two hours is just, unless you're going to get rid of all those people and you're going to re- replace them with elite high performers. And if you're going to do that, your cost base is going to increase by a long way. It, it's just, you know, the, there's just a, a big discrepancy. So um, I think it works well with entrepreneurs, um, uh, you know, but I, I do think a lot of elite athletes struggle with not being in an elite environment. Um, and unless you're running and starting your own business, it's hard to create that. Mm. Yeah, and and you mentioned there just culture for a second and it's hard to build and create culture. And if there are businesses, like one of the things that I teach uh, people is how to become the number one market leader in your industry and all the opportunities come your way if you can you know, meet this framework that I teach. And I do talk a little bit about building culture. So if there is a business out there that is – looking to improve their culture is there one or two things that you've done in your successful journey that's made a real move the needle quite considerable um i don't know if there's one or two but the culture is a is a collection of all the moving parts right so people have to believe in your vision that that's that's the the biggest thing right they have to really care that they're there and the outcome of caring that they're there is that they believe, generally it's because they believe the company they're working for 
is going places, is doing things, is exciting to be involved with, and they know, broadly speaking, where that is. You know, they have trust in the leader. Um, I, I'm a believer that most people are desperate to follow the leader in one way, shape, or form. So you have to articulate a vision, be clear on what it is, and hire people that are very excited to achieve that. Right? That then leads to, um, you know, to consistency of, of culture. But then you have to surround all of that with fun, you know, we always used to talk about um, making each other's lives better. That was our number one rule. You know, if we if we thought about each other through the process, then we would make each other's lives better. In turn, our lives would be better. And the byproduct of that is we'd be better at work, we'd be more efficient, and we'd go, go further to achieving our goal. Um, so the culture component is so important, um, but it's not – it's – I don't believe it's fluff. I don't believe it's like all the happy, friendly, all that bullshit. Uh, I think it's um, it's unifying people around a common goal and all achieving that together. Mm, yeah, well said. And, yeah, so a lot of people try and fake, not fake culture, but that they think because they've set their office up with swings in there yeah. and uh, a table tennis table in the back room that that's building culture where yeah you got to buy into the vision and i think uh that was very well explained yeah all that stuff's crap i i reckon like it it, it helps if everyone's unified on the goal right if everyone's unified and it's also fun then you've nailed it right and um, but yeah it's spending a huge amount of money on an office fit out and you know all that. if you got the right people they'll work in the back of a car you know they'll, they'll if you've got the right people united around the right vision and they're really on track to achieve something great you know and they look back like a person's working career over you know 30 or 40 years if they you know if they can really truly achieve something that they can look back on for the rest of their working life and say we did that that's stronger than any table tennis table or anybody drinks cut on Friday afternoon or any of that sort of stuff because th that is the thing that that you know intrinsically drives you um, and emotionally engages an individual. Mm. I want to move into reach. You've mentioned it a couple of times now, and and the reason this is a really important topic for me, like I always share my story when I'm interviewed myself or um, about that 15 year old leaving home as a 15 year old, not because I wasn't loved. It was just my school went up to year 10 and that was it. I had to move three hours away. And my parents were hardworking, not aspirational, but loving parents. And my year 10 school teacher said on my last day of school, take these 10 two letter words to you uh, with you for the rest of your life and you'll be okay. And it was, if it is to be, it is up to me. And that message is something that I've carried for the last uh, 20, 30 years. I started my first business when I was 22, 23, ended up setting up 22 franchises, built an international business myself. And I always come back to that. Whenever I've had challenges, if it is to be, it is up to me. And I always think that that one message impacted my life and I've trained tens of thousands of people and I've impacted so many lives. So the Reach Foundation um, really is in at that age group you may i may be a bit wrong there but first of all because this is an inter international audience they might not know the name jim steins and he's probably mo one of the most inspiring empowering figures with one of the most incredible stories of all time and you've worked closely with him can you before starting with reach just touch on jim steins as a human being so uh for those who don't know jim was a, a irish born AFL footballer. So he was a Gaelic footballer in Ireland. He moved out to Australia uh, and, uh, and and played AFL football, won a Brownlow, which is the uh, league the league MVP, and uh, holds the record for the most games played consecutively, had an incredibly long, decorated professional football career here in Australia. Um, he and another guy, Paul Curry, who was a film director, founded the Reach Foundation 29 years ago. So um, now 
I first joined Reach 22 years ago, something like that, 23 years ago. And, you know, at that time, you couldn't speak about mental health, you know, and, and, and Reach is a preventative mental health organisation working with young people. And you just couldn't talk about it. Like when I was facilitating, you were actively told not to talk about mental health because it wasn't cool. You know, kids would switch off, teachers would think it's a whole bunch of crap. It's, it's, um, you know, it was a very, very different environment. So these guys were incredibly ahead of their time when it came to supporting young people with a place that they could talk about what was really going on for them. And the, the sort of defining factor of, of reach is that we train and it, all of this started with Jim and Paul. We train young facilitators. So our facilitators that go into schools are, you know, anywhere between 19 and 25. And they walk into schools. We run workshops. And, and the, the primary outcome of those workshops is to get young people understanding themselves better and also understanding the world around them. And so we train facilitators to create these outcomes. Um, by creating these interactive workshops that are incredibly emotionally powerful. Um, and all that was started, yeah, nearly three decades decades ago by Jim and Paul. Mm. And you mentioned you were uh, uh, initially uh, involved in a program, then a facilitator, and you said the facilitator role helped you as a CEO. And um, do you want to just share you know, some of the skills that you learnt in those sort of environments? Yeah, well, mate, Reach, Reach changed my life in many ways. I come from a great background. Like well, one of the misnomers of Reach is that it's for underprivileged kids. And, and yes, we do work with underprivileged kids. Um, but we work with young people from all walks of life. Now, I was a private school educated, great family, you know, uh, you know, great, great uh, family life, all that sort of stuff. Um, and in my first experience with Reach, I went to a Heroes Days, 500 young people in a room. We still do them to this day. And at the start of, at the start of Heroes Day, um, I was pulled up on my seat. Jim was facilitating. And he pulled me up in my seat and he, he said, who are you? And, you know, I had a microphone in my hand in front of everyone there. And, and I said, oh, I don't know, I'm Fergus or, you know, whatever. And he said, no, no, no. He said, I don't care what your name. He said, who are you? You know, what do you stand for? What's important to you? And I sort of fluffed the answer. I really couldn't get through it. I'd never really been asked that before. You know, I'd never thought about it. I was 15 and I'd never thought about anything like that. And later on in the day, I had the microphone in my hand again and I was speaking much more emotively about something, you know, more vulnerable, more real. And he said to me, that's who you are. He said, not just the emotive, vulnerable, you know, Kid, he said, not the footy player, bravado filled, masculine, you know, guy at the start, but all aspects of you, you know, and, and understanding that all those aspects of you are what make up you and what's important to you. Um, if you understand that, you can start to think about who you are. And if you start to actually talk about that stuff more often, you're in an environment where people are caring about you and you're, uh, they're asking you questions in, in about those things. Then you can develop that that sense of self that then goes out and does it, and 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 that really made a shift in my life um, to be exposed to different things in life, to to think about things differently, to ask more questions, to be more engaged, and and ultimately through my process of becoming a reach facilitator and then delivering the work, being much more comfortable with who I am at my core and in my own skin, so then I can go out in the world and I'm not questioning myself every two seconds. Because I'm comfortable with me. Um, and that, you know, that, that was the change that Reach made in my life. And it's the change that we actively see every year to 50,000 young people a year is this sort of little two degree shift that puts them on a different path and, um, you know, has them, has them thinking about life a bit differently. Mm, yeah. Well said. And, and it's a really important topic because. As we're doing this podcast, I think there was a report yesterday that suicide was up like nine percent or something. In, you know, and we've just been through the last three years of things like lockdowns and 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 mental health is a, a real struggle for a lot of people. And kids have lost years of school and all sorts of stuff. So programs like Reach are probably going to shape future generations, um, or 
you know, make a huge impact on that type of uh, environment. And that's certainly an area that I'm really passionate about. And, and you, you just mentioned vulnerability and being empathetic, compassionate. This is sort of like a new economy that people really need to buy into. And I was, um, just to share this story, I was a robot as a human in business with, you know, I nearly lost everything in the global financial crisis, but I dealt with everything internally. And my wife and I, we lost our first son who was stillborn. And um, that happened in 2014. I've got two beautiful children today. That was the first time I'd ever cried in front of my wife or anyone. And I changed as a person from that moment forward and wrote a book and now I have this podcast and everything. But vulnerability and the ability to open up to your person is going to really be a major path forward for people. Do you sort of share that view? Yeah, very much so. So what happens to us as as young people is we we start off as 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 you know kinder age kids right and and you know below five you basically do whatever you want you know like you, you don't get embarrassed really you you just sort of get on with life and I've got three kids under under four and you know I'm always amazed how they can have a full meltdown in the middle of the street and kick and scream and go mad and then just on a dime just now it's all normal again, you know. They just don't, you know. So, so we live our lives sort of after that point. Now, at a certain point, we start to feel things like embarrassment, and judgment, and stuff like that. And so, what happens at that point when we click over into that age bracket? Generally, it's about five ish. And you go to school, and you know, kid laughs at you, right, or says, "I don't want to play with you." And all of a sudden, that registers with you, like, "Well, why?" Maybe there's something wrong with me. You feel bad about it. And what we do as human beings is we put layers on ourselves. And that stuff happens all the time, right, is we put layers on ourselves. So you go to school, you're wearing the wrong shoes. You know, someone laughs at you, put a layer on yourself. You listen to the wrong music. You you, you put your hand up in class and two plus two is five and everyone laughs at you. you put, we keep putting these layers on ourselves to protect ourselves, right? And we do it all the way through. You ask a girl out and she says no. You go, shit, I'm not doing that again, you know? And then there's all this stuff that happens in our lives, right? It doesn't just happen as kids, as adults. We, we all do. But we, we put all these layers around ourselves and, and that becomes the ego that we operate from, right, on a daily basis. Now, we all do it. Some of these layers are great because they do protect us from, you know, from really bad stuff happening to us. Most of these layers we don't understand. And because we don't talk about these things and we don't do this work in schools, most people go through their life not realising they're, they're holding these layers, not realising why they behave, how they behave, not realising the emotional triggers that make them put up their walls. And this is the ego that, that we operate from. It stops us from showing emotion. It stops us from being vulnerable. It stops us from being content. Um, you know, and, and what it does ultimately do is it stops us from developing really deep relationships with individuals because you know as we all know when you meet someone who's quite clearly got their walls up you've you, you got no emotional connection to them you know now through understanding yourself understanding vulnerability and the power of vulnerability understanding you know realness you start to break down some of these layers or at the very least you can on purpose pull them down for a time and you can start to act from your spirit. And again, you know when you see and meet people who truly are acting from their spirit, you get a connection with them. You know, you, you feel something towards them. And, and inevitably, what that allows you to do as an individual is it allows you to deal with bad stuff that comes your way because you're more emotionally equipped to deal with them. And it also allows you to take advantage of opportunities that come your way because you're not self-doubting. You know, you're not you're not trying to find your confidence the whole time. You can really take advantage of good opportunities. So that that is what happens to us as as human beings. So uh, you know, I am a big believer that vulnerability, the ability to be vulnerable, not just cry or for vulnerability's sake, but the ability to truly be yourself and be exposed. You know, have the risk of being exposed as that 
being comfortable with that allows you to go and live an incredibly content, full and fulfilled life. Not having that, being a robot, being blocked off, acting from your ego, means you're always on the back foot rolling through life. Mm, well said. Just, um, you know, when you go through business and life like you have <clears throat> and dealing with adversities and challenges, what's a challenge in business or life that you've faced that you've, you know, really had to like dig deep to get through and, and how did you overcome that? Um, oh, mate, lots. Uh, we have had a lot of failures. I've had a lot of failures. I am the one primarily that does the failing in our business because <laughs> I'm, I, uh, you know, you got to try new stuff and you got to be okay with failure. It's, it's one thing that my footy career really taught me was that if you fail publicly on, you know, on such a public forum in such a big way of a lifelong dream, every other failure from there sort of is not, not as significant. Um, the biggest one that, really left scars for me was the um we i tried to expand the business of our first crack of an overseas business was in london and we were also expanding the business into an event space and a few other things all at the same time so this was a, a number of years ago now um i moved to london we had business expanding in australia and then we had our two core profit making businesses have like the worst quarters I've ever had by a mile, right? And they were trying to make this whole thing work and we got into this incredible cash crunch. We just had no cash because we're investing in London, we're investing in these other things, our businesses are meant to keep the thing rolling over just, just went terribly. And like, honestly, it took 10 years off my life, that whole experience. I thought I was going to lose the whole thing, I thought it was all going. We were, we'd have to we'd have to get you know three days out from payroll, and we didn't have enough money to pay all the staff. You know, and at this point, we had a business. The overall business was still quite a profitable, successful business, but we had more cash going out than we had coming in because we were investing in the future. And that went for it was a it was a really hard year. It then. The cash crunch probably followed for another two years after that. So it was a three year, just stressful anxiety field. Just, it was just terrible, right? And, uh, and what that did outside of just age me and you know, make me just question everything, it made me a substantially better business person, right? I mean, substantially better. Because I've failed and really come close to the end. Um, and so what that has allowed me to do is make sure that, that the risks I take in future are more measured, more understood. Um, and the, the challenge that I really had in the first couple of years after that was, you know, having the courage to take a risk again and having the courage to go and make the next acquisition of the business or do the next thing or whatever it was. Um, cause when you get that close to the edge, it's, scary you know um but you know i managed to uh, get through that did a lot of self-analysis and uh and and sort of you know looking back inwards um to get through that and and was supported great by the people in our business my business partners our staff all through that period um and yeah managed to get through and and, and come out the other end and and now uh yeah, you know, and 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 now all those risks we took have, have, have paid off. You know, so it's it's certainly worth it, but some hard times. Yeah, I mean, I can certainly relate. I mentioned nearly losing everything in the global financial crisis. I was franchise in a business, and I'd just go into banks and get money. And new site, new site, just got to the person would be able to get money easy, and banks stop lending in the global financial crisis. And I'd sign fit outs and all this sort of stuff. And I end up having to finance it through the property that I'd invested in in the lead up. And I lived on a, you know, I always one of my stories I always tell is people. Uh, um, egg sandwiches for two two years <laughs> like yeah. was, but you lose your identity in that period as well because you go from this 
you know, mover and shaker to, you know, nearly a shell of yourself. And I've had this conversation a few times that people have gone to that edge. And I think risk management's probably the thing that you do and self-reflection is probably the lesson you do learn there. So thanks for sharing that story. Yeah, mate, it's an interesting vibe. I mean, when COVID hit, um, you know, and it's not just these major events because inevitably these major events um, turn up, but the thing that is just just striking to me in business that just never gets really spoken about is that we're all human beings, scared of making a mistake, you know, fearful of our of what we look like, um, you know, just the core emotive factor of the human of the human condition. You, you pick up the Fin Review every day and you read about the financial markets and you read about the movements of of you know people and analysts you know giving their recommendations and everything else and it's written as if they're as if they're computers you know as if they're robots and and they're not they're human beings that have got mortgages to pay and trying to get ahead of things and you know markets only move because fund managers move the market you know they 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 buy and they sell and and most of the time it's it's either trying to be greedy and take advantage of an opportunity that's going to give a greater return than anyone else can get or they're scared that if they stay in it too long, they're going to they're gonna drop out the bottom. And it's human factors that that drive all this stuff in business. But we just, we just never talk about it for whatever reason. So a lot of the time, you know, especially in our game, a new, a new marketing director comes into a client, you know, and they do a sweep in, in agencies. You go, well, why? Why? You, you feel more comfortable bringing in your own agency people you feel emotionally more connected to them. It's all human factors. It's very, very little got to do with the um, the actual data um, and the you know the analytics of, of the whole thing. Um, and so, yeah, the, the the human factor is what drives the whole thing, and most of it is irrational and emotional. Mm. Yeah, well said. Um, at the end of every episode, I always have a series of questions I ask every single guest. Um, I call it the rapid fire section, but not necessarily rapid fire answers. Is there a book or podcast or show that you believe that if people listen to, it's going to impact their life dramatically? Um, Moneyball. Moneyball. I don't read books really very often. <laughs> Uh, I watch I watch movies occasionally. I used to watch a lot more before I had kids. Um, Moneyball is a cracking story. Billy Bean, the Oakland A's, the general manager, the risks that he took through that process of changing the way they manage the payroll and changing the talent, uh, that is entrepreneurialism at its very best. Um, and, you know, just to be inspired by that story, I think, is you know, is uh, is well worth a watch. Mm. What about the best bit of advice that you've ever received? Uh, we have a sign, my wife and I have a sign above our cooker at home and it says, only those who dare to fail greatly will ever achieve greatly. And, uh, and we've had it there for as long as we've been together, eight years and, um, and uh, and I, I think that is as true as anything that you're going to hear. If you if you're too scared of failing, um, you're just never going to never going to do anything. So um, that that for me is is what I like to live my life by. Mm. And on the flip side of the coin, the worst bit of advice or something that you just totally disagree with. It could be hustle harder or something like that. Is there something that stands out? Um, the, you know, business isn't emotional and leave yourself at the door and come in and you know, just, just all that old school crap. It just is bullshit. Like the, we did an activity early days of starting the business where I got everyone to, um, go to a train station and all around Melbourne in groups of five and they'd meet in our, um, office near Richmond station. So it's come into Richmond station and, uh, you had to stand on a carriage by yourself at 7.30 in the morning during peak hour and not say anything and just watch everyone and how. And the, the, we got back into the office and I said, well, what did you see? And everyone just said, my God, how depressing is that? Like, you know, you got everyone just – and this is before everyone was glued to iPhones, you know. Like this is 
this is years ago. This is 13 odd years ago. Um, and everyone has to stand around, just looks great faced, depressed, going to their place of employment where they're going to spend the vast majority of their life. Um, and just, you've got to bring your true self. You've got to bring your emotion to work. So but plenty of people tell me that stuff over the years. Um, and I just think it's, I just think it's crap. You've got to humanify the whole thing. Mm. And just on that point, you know, my, the, you know, I, I share the vision and mission around you are only, you do only actually have the one shot at life. And, uh, why waste it for 40 years doing that train trip one hour in, one hour hating what you do? And, you know, my vision and mission is to inspire, empower, educate people to make that most of their one shot at life. And I share that on the back of the story of losing Ethan about, um, you know, he didn't even get one breath on the planet, you know, he, mm. so he didn't get a chance to shine. So I, I, I don't want people to get to their rocking chairs and say, gee, I wish I just traveled the world or gee, I wish I was a better dad or gee, I wish I was, you know, took a risk on that business. Like that's really about what I'm all about. So on that point, what would you say to somebody that might be just sitting there on the train listening to this podcast to inspire them to make the most of their one shot at life? Um, oh, I think it's about understanding why you do or you don't do things. So if you are thinking of, you know, whatever, getting a new job, quitting a job, starting a business, do it, you know, going on a trip, whatever, whatever it is you're thinking about doing. Actually think about why you want to do it and why you don't want to do it or you won't do it. What's stopping you from making the decision? And if what's stopping you from making that decision is I've got to pay the mortgage and that's a reality and that's the only thing stopping you from making that decision, then find a way to solve that individual problem. Mm -hmm. Most people will say, I'd love to go travel the world, but I've got two kids, private schools, and I've got to pay the mortgage. How the hell am I going to go do that? You know? And that's a, that, that's a reality of, of, of life, you know? Or, yeah, geez, I'd love to quit this job doing whatever, um, you know, but I need the money, you know? And you go, okay, but th th those things are realities in life, but they are all ultimately solvable, maybe over a long period of time. The reality is when you truly think about these things, most of the time what's stopping you is the fear of not being able to solve the problem. I've got to pay the mortgage. Okay, well, if you, you, know, you quit your job, you've got enough lead time on that. The fear is that you won't be able to generate enough income at the time that you need to generate it to cover your mortgage cost. That's, that's really what we're talking about, right, in that scenario. Um, so how do you solve for that problem? You know, like, and then if you solve all these problems, then the only thing left is for you to actually go and do it. Um, and, and I just think most people will find an excuse immediately, and that's the reason they can't do stuff, um, without actually breaking it down um, to solve a lot of these problems. Mm. And do you think, um, I think I know the answer to this for you, but for uh, somebody uh, that is listening to this show, the importance of mentors, coaches, and surrounding yourself with the right people to help you thrive in life. Is that something you really believe in? Um, I, I believe in listening to everyone, uh, but only taking what is relevant to you. I'm not a big believer in the mentor thing. Um, I, having someone that you can learn from or multiple people that you can learn from, people that have done it before you, all that sort of stuff, and you going and asking them questions and hearing and listening to their answers and then taking taking the good bits and leaving the rest. Um, you know, having someone who's your mentor who guides you through life or any of that sort of stuff, I'm not a big buyer of, um, but you should listen and ask questions to everybody because you'll get some pieces of information that is that are gems from someone you never thought you'd hear it from and then you get other pieces of information from people that you expect to hear it from and you can merge those together but you ultimately have to go and do it 
you got to make the decisions, you've got to make the calls, you've got to take the risks, you've got to go do whatever it is you've got to do, and you have to do it on your terms. If you're doing it someone else's way, it'll never work. Um, so it's sort of the combination of the whole thing, but most important is you back yourself. Mm. Well said. And we're at the end of the episode, so I want to just make sure people know how to connect with or find you, Reach, um, Bastion Group. You've, you know, you so send people to where you want to send them to. Uh, the, uh, the best place is reach.org.au. Um, you know, if people want to uh, want to contribute or donate to to Reach and our our cause for young Australians um, in ensuring that they're equipped with with the right mental health tools to go and take on life uh, reach.org.au uh, if you want to get in touch with me personally you can do that through that that website as well and and uh, you know any support through through the reach foundation would be greatly appreciated from anyone mm. and from me it's been a very fascinating and educational session uh, so i want to thank you for jumping on the show good on you mate good to be here thanks i was a robot as a human in business with you know, I nearly lost everything in the global financial crisis, but I dealt with everything internally. And my wife and I, we lost our first son who was a stillborn. And um, that happened in 2014, but two beautiful children today. That was the first time I'd ever cried in front of my wife or anyone. And I changed as a person from that mo moment forward and wrote a book and had uh, this podcast and everything. But, vulnerability and the ability to open up to your person is going to really be a major path forward for people.